You are listening to the Digital Parent Podcast with your host, Sed Lewis. Hey parents, welcome to another episode of the Digital Parent Podcast. And on today's show, we have my great friend, Michelle Cox, a.k.a. the Computer Lady. And the thing I love about Michelle is that she's also an author of a children's book by the name of Mommy is a Computer Smarter Than Me. And this book really focuses on young kids learning about computers at a young age. It's sort of like a Dr. Seuss rhyme type of book. And the thing that's also very important about Michelle is that she has spent years as a service technician and she knows how kids can get viruses on computers and how they can get in contact with predators on computers. And she spent a lot of time providing a lot of details on how to avoid those dangerous types of situations. So this is a show that I really love and I hope you love it too. But before we get into it, a quick word from our sponsor, Ill Spy. Parents, M-Spy is the ultimate monitoring tool for all devices. M-Spy remotely tracks GPS locations, calls, texts, messages, WhatsApp, Snapchat, web browsers, pictures, and much more. With M-Spy, you can also restrict unwanted calls, block websites, or even block apps. Go to mspy.com for more information. Hey, Michelle, welcome to the Digital Parent Podcast. We're so happy to have you on our show today. Sigrid, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Hey, Michelle, we've been following all your work, especially your, your Twitter feed, which is really popping, talking about your new book, Bobby is a Computer Smarter Than Me, which is a phenomenal read for especially smaller kids, you know, for 6 to 10. Great book to start out learning about computers and learning about technology. But before we talk about the book, Michelle, you know, what led you to this book and what part of your life did you decide to, you know, transform from your excellent career as a computer technician it's writing children's books. Well, I don't know if you know, but um, I'm a breast cancer survivor. And um, I had oh, wow. surgery September 2nd. And while I was at home convalescing, and when you have this type of surgery, you, like your mind is racing and all these thoughts and things. And God was like, you know, calm down. I've got work for you to do. And I was sitting home convalescing, and the books just started really writing themselves because God gave me this great gift. Wow. So you, you felt like that tragedy really got you focused on his direction that he needed you to go into. Oh, I absolutely know it did. Uh, if I hadn't if I hadn't had breast cancer, I'd probably be working my regular job, doing the same thing every day, and might not have ever written a children's book. So why did you decide to write it for like a younger audience, as opposed to like middle school kids, high school kids? Was there a reason you wanted to start a little bit younger? Well, one of the things I know statistically is kids aren't reading on the level that they should to. And boys especially, they, are, they tend to be slower readers than girls. And so my aim and focus was to get kids reading but give them something entertaining, entertaining to read. And when we talk about computers and there's so much technology around right now, no one is actually writing to kids about computers. And so... Being a technician, I really understand it. And one of the things I do, even when I teach, I love to see the lights come on when they start to learn and they hear about these different processes. You know, I think that's a good point, Michelle, because there are a lot of people that talk about technology, kids having iPhones and tablets, but nobody talks about like teaching them about those devices and kind of like how to introduce technology to kids at a young age. And it sounds like this book may be that perfect perfect opportunity to do that oh i think so and i think it's a great medium because it's not only a uh, it teaches them about it, but it also has a lot of pictures it's a rhyming type book kind of the dr seuss type thing but except for it has this whole section that teaches them how the computer works and it also goes towards their self-esteem as well as knowing how much smarter and more diverse they are than a computer and why is that important? Why is that self-esteem part important in the book? And why did you choose, you know, like you say, you could just wrote a book about, like, you know, computers 101, you know, what's a mouse, what's, you know, a desktop. Why did you go to the part about the self-esteem with the younger kids? Well, one thing we have to remember with kids is because we spend so much time with technology because, like, I work from home, and ki- my grandkids are always like, well, why are you in the office so much? It's like, I'm actually working. 
and they don't understand that part and they think sometimes that you're not paying attention to them. And so we have to teach them that not only we, we, we're paying attention, but that the computer is a tool that we use to help us and it's not smarter than us. We use it to gain knowledge, but also we tell it what to do to help us and to help it. That's actually important. You kind of teach them at a young age to take control of the technology opposed to the technology taking control of you in return. Oh, absolutely. Because a lot of times, um, because parents are afraid of the technology themselves, they don't really engage with the kids. And this is when we have the um, problems with cybersecurity because the kids are getting into things that the parents don't really understand. So the, the book actually bridges the gap between not only the child and computers, but the parent and computers, because the parents also learn that the computer is a tool, and they also get something from reading it with the, with the child. Is there anything else that parents get out of purchasing the book and reading the book with their small child? Well, the other thing is when you read to children and you engage in that story time, you build bonds with your children that are lifelong. Those are memories that they'll always have. And the thing about this wonderful book, it's a nice big picture book. So when you have in that story time and you've got the pictures there that explain it, it's easier for you while a child is sitting in your lap or they're reading in front of you to capture their attention and to have that loving moment with them. That's interesting. What has been some of the feedback you've gotten from small kids when you see them read the book? Have you talked to any kids about the book? I actually had, and I actually just posted a little video of one of the kids reading the book. I was at church Sunday, and I had some of the copies of the book. And I had children as young as two and three grab the book because it's a big book and it has lots of pictures. And they go, Mommy, look, computer, computer. They already know. And they're already in one little girl. She grabbed the book. She was about seven years old. And she got in the corner and she just started getting in it. And she was just reading. It was just amazing. Her mom was like, oh, my God, this is so awesome. So kids love it because it has pictures and it's easy for them to engage. Now, on another level on that, I deal with kids that have special needs. I have a godson that's autistic. Okay. He loves this book, one, because it's easy for him to read and it doesn't frustrate him like a chapter book. Because he's not on that level yet. And so he looks at the pictures and him and mommy read it together. And they've read it about three times already. And they've had the book for approximately two weeks. Are there any like special challenges when it comes to like autistic kids and their use of technology that you're aware of? Well, some, uh, some autistic kids uh, grab onto technology because they don't like to engage with people. So technology is their way of engaging because I have one of, one of the kids, his name is Jesse. He can actually text probably 20 times faster than you and I put together. Right. But he does not engage uh, verbally. So this is his way of engaging. And the more I reach into him with the computer, the more I'm starting to bring him out of that shell because I have also taught him that he can use a narration feature to talk. And because the narration feature is talking, he's starting to get grasp those words better and get a better sense of engaging. And do you think, like, with those autistic kids being so super on top of the, the technology, especially when it comes to texting and communicating that way, are they a little bit more at risk of things like cyberbullying because of that? They can be. It really depends. But like I tell you, with all kids... We really have to be vigilant on where they go online, who their friends are, and we need to make sure that they're not going to places that they shouldn't. That's why I really believe in quorum. I believe in parents having parental notifications. Even when my, our niece used to live with us, I had parental notifications. I knew everywhere she went when she got on the computer. If she was going to a site that was rated uh, something that was adult content, it would notify me automatically and I would shut it down. I also have a way of locking down the computers by IP address. Those are things that parents can learn, and it's very important. So let me ask you this question, Michelle, because I can hear these mothers in my ears say, okay, Michelle, that may be easy for you because you're a techie. You know, that's what you do. That's very difficult for me. How easy is it 
really for parents to just really sit back and block IP addresses and really stay on top of monitoring their kids and where they're going on the internet. It actually, with Windows 10, 8, and 7, they have parental controls that will take the parents step by step into how to block, their, uh, to shut down or give the, their, their kids' computers what we call quiet time. Okay. That means from, they can say from 7 o'clock to 7 a.m., they, they have no Internet access. It will totally shut the computer down where they can't get on. That's excellent. I'll make sure we uh, put that in the show notes so parents can kind of research that. Now, and, as a mother and a grandmother of like 10 kids, like what are some of the other things that you use with your grandkids to make sure that they're safe? Well, first thing I do is or when they come to my house, you know, me and mom and dad talk because all my grandkids now are older. Okay. But when they were younger, I would do things like spook them. I can, when, if you're on my network, I can get into your computer. And what I used to do is I would move the mouse around and write, write on your screen. And that would spook them. Now, every parent can't do that. But, <laughs> right, uh, right. That, you know, I would, they would be trying to go somewhere. I'd move the mouse and then it's like, or I'd make the computer shut off. And they're like, for a minute there, they were like freaked out. And they would come and it's like, Grammy, we can't get on the computer. I said, no, I shut it down because it's time for you guys to go to bed. Right. <laughs> right. Like, right. But the, the thing about it is you don't want it to be a punishment, but at the same time, I explained to them about cyber safety. I explained to them, I showed them real world consequences on things that happen when they are disobedient and they try to go somewhere because they can get viruses and things of that nature. And that's why they know when they come to Grammy's house, you know, we know viruses are our no zone in my house. Uh, none of the computers I have have viruses on them one because uh, that's what I do for a living and I'm good at disaster recovery. Right. So, so as, a, as a technician, like how often or how many times have you seen kids get viruses on their parents' computers? Oh, Segret, if I if I told you how many <laughs> how many times and how much money I've made off of parents letting their kids run amok on computers, you'd be surprised. And wow. we're talking about into the tens of thousands of dollars, easily, because your average uh, when I was doing field service. Your average visit to somebody's house when you go at seventy dollars for your service charge. You right. go there, depending on how bad the virus is, you're gonna have to wipe out the, the whole computer and rebuild it. That means you're gonna have to try to extract all their data, save all their favorites and pictures and those things on another drive to be clean, and then you have to um, wipe out the whole computer and reset it up. So you're talking about a minimum of a two hundred, three hundred dollar charge, depending on the ex the extent of the um, data that they have on it and how valuable it is. I had one lady, she got a virus so bad, the virus actually started cooking the CPU. Wow. So I was able to um, get a hard drive out of it, you know, because the thing was actually smoking on fire. And I was able to get, put it out, get the hard drive out. I was able to clean the drive and get all her pictures off. And she told me, she said, if it cost me a million dollars to get those pictures, I wanted them because there were all the pictures of her kids from when they were babies and the oldest one was six years old. But it was only $234. I had to give her, get her a new drive, get her a new, I had to get her a new power supply and get everything up because my thing is I'm here to help people. I don't do service work as much as anymore because I work for a company and I teach repair now more so than I do service work. Gotcha. So when it comes to viruses, I'm just fascinated by the topic because I think a lot of people think that, you know, you get a virus by, like, downloading something you should be downloading. Viruses come in several different ways. Now, you can get a virus by if you're going on your, your – in your URL airline and you mistype a word, you can get redirected and you can get what we call a drive-by. Okay. Or someone can send you an email and you get an attachment. And the attachment might have a virus in it. Sometimes if you're visiting websites and you can get redirected and you can get what they call a bot. Right. So there are different ways to get viruses. But my thing is, like I tell everybody, even with good antivirus protection, you can let the virus in if you don't know where you're going. That's why when you go to websites, 
make sure that you see those HTTPSs and you know they have the secure socket layers in them and that you're protected. If you're not sure, immediately don't go. Just cut it off, find another way to search. And the other thing is, don't type in the URL line. Bring up a search engine like Internet Explorer or Yahoo or Bing and type in the search line what you're looking for. Then when you go to the page, look for the official page because you have some pages that are ads and those ads try to get you to come into their page and then all of a sudden they're downloading stuff if you're not careful. The other thing is uh, as a parent you're the administrator but instead of you uh, working on the internet in your administrative account making another account for you to go on as a standard user that way if somebody or something tries to download it has to ask permission from you as the administrator if you're the administrator if you're not in that account you don't have to worry about an automatic download because it can't right. but as the administrator it will try to download because you're the administrator and if you're not watching those bots and those tr that spyware or malware can get in that way that's why I'm really careful when I have computers uh, and I'm working like when I have kids, I make sure I have their account set up. I have passwords. You know, you brought up a good point about the email because I know a lot of parents provide, that they said provide, but a lot of their kids to sign up for Gmail accounts. Should they really be watching that at, at what age they're allowing kids to have access to email? Because you're right, they can get an attachment for anywhere and download that attachment out of ignorance, and boom, you have a virus that's infected. The whole well, computer system. One thing about kids and email accounts, again, not only do you have to watch the email accounts, but you need to be monitoring the type of emails that come in because we have predators. That, that's, that's a commonality, and that's the thing about social media. That's why we always tell parents, you have to use care in how much information you give out. Um, my thing is, even with Facebook, in all the different types of social media. Be careful of what type of pictures you post. Make sure you're not posting the kids' birth dates, where they live, their addresses, those types of things, and warn them to do the same thing because those are the ways that predators come in. And not only that, they can stalk your, your kids. Once they find out where you're living, they're going to be trying to come by the house and following school buses and things of that nature. And that's why you have to be extra vigilant especially with kids of a young age because they're innocent and they don't realize the dangers that we know as adults. And that's why it's really important for you to do so. Hey, that's an excellent point, Michelle, when it comes to social media, because you're right. Most of the predators, especially when it comes to human trafficking, things of that nature, their number one way of targeting kids is through social media and by the information they get from kids' uh, social profiles or Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, or wherever they're on, that's how they get the, the information to stalk them in real life. Oh, absolutely. And that's why um, a lot of kids have phones these days. What I tell parents is there are, are several apps that you can put on a kid's phone where you can monitor. Also, make sure you turn their GPS signal on. That way, if they've got a phone, you know where they are. Also, in your parental controls through the phone company, you can go in and say, from this time to this time, the kid can't be online. Right. That's why if they're in school, they shouldn't be talking to their friends on the phone. You can actually have your service where it's cut, uh, cut off during those times, and they can only dial out if it's an emergency. That's correct. You pay that bill every month, so you have a lot of leeway to do a lot of things for that, with that line that you're giving your kid. And as long as we're adhering to the safety protocols as parents, we help to keep our kids safe from predators, and that's the most important thing right now. So Michelle, quickly before we leave, I want to talk about your upcoming book, uh, Bobby, Why Can We Only Speak with Daddy on a Computer, where you tackle the issue of kids communicating with their parents who are in active duty in the military. What are some of the benefits you see of kids staying in contact with their parents who serve our country? Well, that book is really personal for me. My father uh, was a military veteran, and, and he passed away, but he was in the Navy for 27 years, and he served in three wars. And my father was actually deployed when I was born. My mother had to send a telegraph for, to notify him of my birth. But nowadays, uh, like my neighbor, 
his young son was born while he was away and he never saw his father until he was almost a year and a half old and he never knew who he was and then when the father came to the door and he came in he actually started crying because he didn't know his father and so that's one of the reasons why it's very important to use Skype and FaceTime and Snapchat and those things to enter to engage the kids with the father or the mother or the parent that's away so they know who they are so they can hear their voice and they can bond that way they don't have those traumatic experiences when the parents come home that's excellent do you have a date of where the book is uh, coming out that you try to shoot for okay now the book is already printed what we're shooting for now is to get a large order because what happens is um, we got a small order and a small order costs more than we're selling the book for. So once we get a larger order, that will cut the cost down of the book. It'll cost because the book is nineteen ninety nine, but we're actually paying twenty six dollars a copy for the book until we get an order of five thousand or more. When we get order of five thousand, then the book goes down to half price, and then uh, we offer free shipping. And after that, we make a few dollars profit. Excellent. But the first book, Barbie is a Computer Smarter Than Me, is already out, correct? It is out. And uh, the next book will be out 2017. We were going to shoot for the end of this year because we were writing one in the middle of that called Mommy, What Are the Olympics? to uh, pay tribute to the Olympics. And for kids that they see the Olympics, but they don't know how it got its start. They don't know the fact that at one time, girls couldn't even participate in the Olympics and some little trivial things that I think that's really cute for kids to oh, know wow, about this the Olympics. Oh, wow, going to be excellent. So we were, we were doing an homage to the Olympics, and then in 2017, we were going to do uh, Mommy, Why Can We Only See Daddy on the Computer Screen as an homage to veterans, and I was dedicating that one to my dad. And hopefully, part of my work with books and writing books is to do philanthropic work and we were hope, hopefully going to donate some of the proceeds to the uh, DAV and the uh, Wounded Warriors project because they are some of the uh, philanthropic endeavors that I have that I donate through through my job and I would like to continue to do that type of work because that's my purpose and that's what God gave me to do. Well Michelle you have an amazing story for our peers who listen to this podcast, where can they find your books? Where can they go out and buy it? What's the best way to get in contact with you as well? Okay. Now, if you want to buy Mommy's the Computer Smarter Than Me, you go to www.tmrcus.com. That stands for the Mommy Readers Collection US. That's tmrcus.com. I'm on Twitter at Michelle underscore TCL1, and that stands for Michelle the Computer Lady because that's what everybody calls me because I did service work, and every time somebody sees me, even in my community, they're like, hey, it's the Computer Lady. Stop her. I need some help. So you can reach me that way. We have a page on Facebook. The Mommy Readers Collection is on Facebook. You can reach us there as well. Well, thanks so much for being on our show, Michelle. We'll make sure that everyone has the links to all your books all your social media contacts, and we wish you the best. Segret, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. I love what you're doing in the community. Please keep telling people about cybersecurity and keeping kids safe. I love you so much. Thank you so much, brother. We will. Hey, Pierce, I hope you really enjoyed the episode with Michelle. And once again, make sure you go to our show notes and get the links to purchase all her outstanding books, especially if you have any young kid that's like a toddler age or get ready to go to like primary school or elementary school. I think this is a really good read for them. I have a copy for my kids, and my kids definitely love it, and they're all below the age of 10. So I highly recommend her book. And make sure you also subscribe to the Digital Parent Podcast or iTunes, and make sure you hit us up on Facebook at Digital Parent, and also on Twitter, and let us know how much you think about the show. If you really like this episode, leave us some feedback. Until the next time.